Welcome back, guys, to the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve, where last episode, after cross-examining Madame Tuspel's testimony about the Professor Waxwork, we learned more about how she made it, learning about a contact with the murderer's body that showed no sign of rigor mortis when it should have set in. After pointing this out, we brought to the court's attention the newspaper article, and that the man that supposedly saw the professor's return from the grave was in this courtroom, Enoch Dreber, as we pressed to link the professor to the current case and to Courtney Scythe to get her to stand as a witness, with Barak agreeing to summon her as we take on a joint testimony in the cemetery ten years earlier. The reason I was in Logate Cemetery at all ten years ago was for a spot of moonlighting, shall we say. Yes, the illustration in that newspaper article was based on what I witnessed that night. But thinking back now, I realized that I never actually saw the professor. Soon afterwards, I was visited by a young woman who sculpted a model of me from wax. Then I gave up my dream of becoming a scientist. And it was all because of that newspaper article. Wait a minute. You're... You're claiming you didn't actually see the professor now. Of course, you'd have to have a screw loose if you believed a corpse could come back from the dead. But, so you're saying this article is... not worth the paper is printed on? I think that would describe it perfectly, yes. Ah! If the details in the article aren't true, it nullifies your argument for why Mr. Drebber and Dr. Scythe would have been working together. So he's discrediting himself to cripple my argument. Uh, tell me, witness. You claim to have been in the cemetery on some auxiliary business. Can you elaborate? That's right. Grave robbing, to be precise. As you know, Logate Cemetery is at the rear of Barclay Prison. So among students at the university, it had a reputation for being haunted by the ghosts of condemned convicts. Oh, grave robbing, you say? Yes, exhuming fresh corpses to sell is reasonably lucrative. Of course, I never laid a finger on any valuables buried within the, with the dead. Oh, okay. So you were one of these so-called resurrectionists, a particularly unpleasant scourge on society. Actually, my fellows and I went by another name. The Repurposers. That... that is quite beyond the pale. You would invite divine retribution, sir. Yes, well, I think I suffered retribution enough. The Daily Circus eventually unearthed my name and put it in print. It caused me a great many headaches. In the end, I had to leave the university. That was the only paper with a bad grace to identify me unambiguously, I might add. I see. Out of interest, who drew the illustration for this article? Ah, yes, that was the reporter who exposed me. He sketched that right in front of me as I described the scene. Obviously, as time ticked on, I bitterly regretted what I'd done, claiming to have seen something I never truly saw. Foolish. Very foolish. Hmm. Well, counsel of the defense, you may proceed to the court examination now. At once, my lord. In the cemetery ten years earlier, our turn. Is Courtney not going to jump in on any of this? The reason I was in Logate Cemetery at all ten years ago was for a spot of moonlighting, shall we say. <laughs> By moonlighting, you mean grave robbing, do you? Surely you only need to look at the graveyard scene and my appearance to gauge the answer to that? The lantern and spade. But who on earth would want to buy a dead body? Any major hospital. A hospital? In order to better understand the human body, the study of anatomy is crucial to medical science. But there isn't a hospital in the world that has enough specimens to work with. Though obviously, they can't openly express an interest in obtaining more by dubious means. As aspiring scientists, we young research students had no money to work with, as I'm sure you can imagine. So we made surreptitious arrangements with a hospital via some of our medical student acquaintances. We would never take anything of value from the graves. This was all for the fervence of science, you see. That's what we all told ourselves every time we stole into the graveyard at night, spade in hand. You realize body snatching is a serious crime. 
If you were caught, you could expect the gravest of consequences. We students were caught between the hammer and the anvil. We needed funds for research. Professor Hairbrain said exactly the same. I'm quite speechless at the apparent levity with which you've revealed this abhorrent behavior. Well, if you wanted to know why I was there at Logate Cemetery, that's the reason. But I never expected it to end the way it did. That I regret to this day. Yes, the illustration in that newspaper article was based on what I witnessed that night. Hold it! The strange happening at Logate Cemetery, which you now deny. Not entirely. I ran to fetch the police at the time, you know. I was shaking like a leaf. But they didn't believe a word of it. In fact, I was very nearly arrested myself. So you went to the papers instead? I started big with the London News, but unsurprisingly, they didn't want to know either. In the end, though, it was reporters from the gossip rags, the gutter press that came to get my story. And it spread like the plague through the capital as gossip-hungry Londoners lapped up the tale. The story was in every single paper at the time, with the exception of some broadsheets. And yet only two or three of them actually interviewed me personally. Most of the accounts turned out to be very interpretive ghost stories. What about the article in the Daily Circus? That particular journalist found me at my dormitory. I don't know how, but he discovered my name. So I recounted to him exactly what had happened that night. And from your description, he drew this illustration. Precisely. That's how I learned that the condemned man was the infamous professor. Because the reporter told me so. I had no idea myself, you see. Newspaper reporters are wont to snoop around in matters that don't concern them. So the scene portrayed in the illustration is accurate, then. Well... Thinking back now, I realize that I never actually saw the professor at all, though. Hold it! What are you talking about? I think I explained already, didn't I? Logay Cemetery is at the Rio Barclay Prison. So it was renowned among the students at the university for being haunted by the ghosts of condemned convicts. For some absurd reason, I was scared of the graveyard at night. And as a result, only too willing to believe that nonsense about the dead coming back to life. But you said you actually saw it. I said what I'd seen in my mind's eye. After all, resurrection is impossible, isn't it? You'd have to be unhinged to think otherwise. Unless, of course, you have some evidence that proves I encountered the professor that night. I don't know. Is there any material evidence that could show he really did see the professor? If we have anything at all, Mr. Nalahodo. I know. I need to present it against that irritatingly backtracking statement of his. The point is, that night was a pivotal moment in my life. And so we move onwards. Do I have any evidence? The physical evidence that he was there? I mean, I have the camera, but, like, that's literally around his... Why does he have a camera there anyway? Maybe to document the body? I don't know. But he had a camera on him, and we saw a camera on the thing, but of course it had no picture in it. it did have blood on it. Hmm. I don't think that's probably physical evidence at this point in time, but it's just... Every time we get deeper into the thing, we need to constantly keep reminding ourselves about what we actually have and what we don't have. Was that the actual camera? Hmm. Soon afterwards, I was visited by a young woman who sculpted a model of me from wax. Hold it! That young woman being Madame to Spells, of course. Precisely. I must say, I didn't expect to run into her again like this ten years later. As I have explained, I went by the name published in the article and... Commissar, I found the man. Yes, the article in the Daily Circus, I think you said. I was a poor student with barely a penny to my name at the time. And the young lady put five pounds in front of me. 
So you readily consented to having a waxwork of yourself made and gave permission for it to be put on display. I did. I should sell what little I had to sell, I concluded. Ah, we. Oui. I remember now. I purchased something else from you that day, n'est-ce pas? Did you? I can't say I remember. What was it, madame? His camera. Ah. Oh yes, I made a point of taking you with me whenever I made an excursion into any cemetery. You took a camera with you, sir. To what end? To recall the details of the bodies I disinterred. But I had no intention of ever visiting a graveyard again after that night, so I sold it. Hmm. I see. But I still have it, Monsieur. It is part of the special exhibit in my House of Horrors. I am very meticulous about such details. It is the Tuspel's way. It would seem, then, that this is the very camera Mr. Drebber took with him to Logay Cemetery on the night in question. Yes. Interesting. The details of the camera have now been updated. Maybe I can present that now as physical evidence because we know it was there ten years ago. The details of the camera have been updated in the court record. I'd say, considering that just got updated from that statement, that's pretty much it. We kind of decided, like, the camera's the only thing we had on us. Thank God we went forward. We would have had our one more penalty down. We've been down to three. It's been terrible, drastic times. No! Drastic times. I'm guessing I am presenting here because that was the irritating statement that was mentioned. Right? Present? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Objection! God damn, no! The defense would have to object to that last statement, my lord. And I would have to overrule your objection, counsel. What? You said about that irritating statement. The defense would have to accept the penalty given. Glad to hear it. And you would also have to think again, hmm? Wait, so now... Do I have to... Press this statement again? To wait for him to talk more? And then present it again? I have no clue! I guess the physical evidence of the camera is more about the blood, though. So, when you think about it, I guess we haven't got to that point. Of course, we know that the person was shot. The professor was shot. So there might be blood spatter from that. The side of the camera that the blood spatter's on would be the him facing slightly away. Or, yeah, it depends exactly where he was looking at the time. Why am I getting loads of penalties in this one? Loads. Two. Supposed to present something to there, so let's go over to here. Then I gave up my dream of becoming a scientist. It was all because of that newspaper article. Hold it! Gives us time to think. This article, you mean? Published in the Daily Circus. Yes, somebody informed the dean that it was my name that appeared in the article. And carelessly that slipped that night after night, I was digging up graves. Hardly a model student, you might say. The university's reputation was execrably defiled, and I was expelled as a result. Oh dear, I had no idea. And having been run out of university, you found employment in a somewhat specialist trade. You combine your knowledge of science with knowledge of stage magic to create various experimental machines intended to demonstrate never-before-seen technology. And you use those deceptive machines to trick the government and private investors into giving you money. Professor Albert Hairbrain was just your latest victim, wasn't he? Whatever are you talking about? I have no recollection of doing anything of the sort. She's staying so silent. What's Trevor up to? Why would he suddenly change his tune and recant his claim? I wonder if perhaps it's because his circumstances have changed now. What circumstances? 
Well, if he admits to having seen the professor emerging alive from his grave ten years ago, it will expose a secret in Dr. Sive's past that she would desperately want to hide. Yes, of course! If Drebber and Dr. Sive are working together now, then if Drebber were to betray her, there would be no reason for her to continue to cooperate. In that case, there's only one way around it. I'll have to prove he really did see it. Prove he really did see the professor's corpse coming back from the dead as he originally claimed. Yes, Mr. Nalhodo, exactly! Right, so the only evidence... Okay, this is a statement where it's like, press e present evidence to. But I don't know if I press it again now or not and wait for a time. Because there was no time in the original go-through. The only things about that time... Are the camera... And the article itself. The O Asman on it. Just trying to read it really quickly. Because we've read it before. We only have like two things that we can even present here. Or two things that actually are linked to that day. <laughs> As I try to think. I tried one. Do I just try the other take a second penalty and then kind of go with what we've got from there? Or is it just the fact that the camera is proven to be on his person and this picture is incredibly accurate with the camera listed on it? Which suggests an, an, an eyewitness to the eyewitnessing. Which is probably that to be fair. My god, it is. Sorry, Mr. Trevor, but I don't believe that. Don't believe what? Your latest claim. You did see the professor on that night ten years ago. Mm, oh dear, you seem to be at odds. But I was there, and you were not. I know what I didn't see. The illustration with this article was drawn based upon what you told the journalist that you witnessed. A figure emerging from a tomb, wearing an iron mask. Yes, when the killer was tried ten years ago. It was decided in the closed court's ruling that the man would wear the mask to hide his identity. It wasn't to be removed even during his execution and subsequent burial. And not even the prison wardens were to see the man's face. But obviously, the provision of this mask was not public knowledge. So, Mr. Drebber. As you've just heard. Ah! A lowly student of the University of London certainly wouldn't have known about the condemned man's mask. I completely forgot about that line of things. So unless you'd actually seen the professor that night, it's inconceivable that the artist would have included the mask in that illustration. Ah! Well. This is an episode where I've gone terribly wrong. Order! Order! Well, Mr. Drebber. This is the penalty I sometimes get for filming a week apart of episodes. It's a vile scene, isn't it? If you look closely. And as I've already been at pains to point out, I was utterly petrified. Which is why I had it in my head that I'd seen such a blood-curdling sight. But afterwards, I came to my senses and realized that... I'd be mistaken. You... You're still saying you didn't see it? If you're stubbornly sticking to that story, witness... Then amend your testimony to explain exactly how you think your eyes deceived you. Of course, of course! Only too happy to oblige. I can't believe he's still not going to concede the point! What I, in fact, witnessed was a fellow grave robber at work. Okay. Hold it! A fellow grave robber? What are you talking about? Well, I wasn't the only one busy in the cemetery that night, you know. Other body snatchers were at work. Of course, when I saw one emerging from the hole he dug, my heart very nearly stopped. 
So that's the terrifying sight I actually saw, you see. You're claiming it was just another student on equally insalubrious business as yourself. Many of the medical students would wear metal masks to protect them from bacteria during dissections. Clearly, the fellow was using such a mask to protect his anonymity. Wouldn't you say? Objection! But there's more to the story, isn't there? The article goes on to say, In the next second, a gunshot rang out suddenly from behind. The bullet pierced the resurrected man's chest, whose breath then stilled once more. We might assume that the sexton discovered the miscreant at work, perhaps, and fired upon one of them. If a gravedigger shot someone in the cemetery, I think it might have been rather big news, my lord. And behind a prison. Ah, yes, well... I can only assume it was an embellishment bolted on later by the reporter. It's you. Okay. Excuse me. Madame to spells. Don't take it out of Mr. Sholmes. Oh la la, pardon. I was lost in my thoughts. Would it be fair to say that Mr. Drebber's last remark was significant to you in some way? I thought it was a little strange, that is all. How Monsieur Drebber could claim this now? If you don't mind me saying, madame, what are you talking about? Well, when I met you ten years ago at your university dormitory, you recounted to me about your adventures in the cemetery, no? Including the gunshot. Stop! You might want to watch your tongue, you know. Objection! Have a care, Drebber. That's no way to speak to a lady. Ah. Please, Madame Two Spells, carry on. Of course. According to what Monsieur Drebber told me at the time, he did hear a gunshot from behind him, and the bullet hit the condemned man. I said nothing of the sort. No, you were very explicit about the details. About the mask that the figure was wearing. And the blood that spattered over you when he was shot. Ah, now we get to the camera. Enough! Shut up, woman! You're making all this up! That will do. Mr. Drebber. Hmm? Yes? You refute the account just given by Madame to Spells. I have no recollection of ever saying those things. Come on, do you really expect us to believe you? Control yourself, counsel. I will not permit baseless accusations in my courtroom. Right. Under the circumstances, I think it best that you supplement your testimony with a statement to clarify your position on this witness. But. Very well. There was no gunshot from behind me at all, nor any spattering blood. Do I bother pressing this one or do I just present? <laughs> Hold it! Yeah, Madame to Spells has testified that you told her about both of those details. Not true. I said nothing of the sort. Ten years have passed. Without material evidence to the contrary, you have no grounds on which to question the witness's word. Ah! Tell me, Madame to Spells. We? Oui? What exactly did Mr. Drebber say about the blood that apparently spattered on him? Alors, this is what he told me. All of a sudden, he heard a very loud gunshot from behind his back. The bullet hit the figure who was emerging from the tomb in the middle of the chest, in his heart. Hmm. One dreadful sight after another. And since Monsieur Drebber was at the time facing towards the condemned man, the blood sprayed from the wound and spattered on his body. That is what he told me. So, not an experience you would ever forget, is it? Precisely, and I didn't forget it. Because, as I've already said, it never happened in the first place. <laughs> He's clearly lying. If only I had some evidence to prove it. Can't let him win, Mr. Nalahodo. So we mustn't overlook a single detail, no matter how small. And so now that we have the camera trap, 
And we worked through our working with the wrong answers again. Or right answer, wrong working. We can now present the camera to present our trap. Hey! Objection! Mr. Trevor, do you remember this camera? But that is the camera from that fateful night. Yes, we borrowed it from the House of Horrors. It's the camera you took with you to the cemetery that night, Mr. Drebber. And is that supposed to be significant? This kind of camera is rarely seen in our homeland, so my colleague and I were keen to examine it closely. We noticed that the lens extends forwards on the end of some bellows. Like this. Hold it! What's that? There, just on the bellows. It looks like... A dark red stain. Ah! That's right. It's a rather conspicuous mark here on the bellows, in fact. Good lord. Are you suggesting... Yes, my lord. It would appear to be... A spatter of blood. Something that could be confirmed with a simple chemical test. Isn't that right, Dr. Scythe? It would be difficult to determine if it was human blood and not the blood of some animal. But yes, to test whether or not it's blood at all is simple enough. I propose that Madame Tuspel's testimony was correct, and that on the night in question ten years ago, you were spattered with blood from the gunshot wound. Well, I, uh... And that furthermore, you really did witness the condemned professor emerging from his tomb. Uh, ah! There's simply no way you could have forgotten such a traumatic experience. In other words, the only explanation is that you're trying to hide the fact that you saw the professor that night. Objection! But why? Why would he want to do that? Well, not for his own gain, it would seem. For whose, then? Who could benefit? Mr. Trevor is obviously lying in order to protect somebody. My goodness, he's shielding someone. Yes, my lord. And clearly, it's someone who doesn't want the truth about the professor coming back to life to be exposed. Well, counsel, who is it then? Who is this witness trying to protect by lying about what he saw that night? Take that! The obvious answer. It's Dr. Scythe. Scythe? What? Whatever do you mean? Imagine if the convict who'd been sentenced to death was not in fact killed. Imagine if that was to come to light. What are you insinuating? And imagine if the convict in question was the country's most hated mass murderer. If it was the professor. Now that... That would be an unprecedented scandal! Objection! This is beyond a joke. Need I point out that the dead cannot come back to life? What you're suggesting would mean... that the execution never actually happened. Yes, that's exactly what it would mean! Objection! Once a man is sent to the gallows, he hangs. No one could escape, not in Great Britain. Objection! But the fact is, there was a witness to the fact that the man did escape his hanging. If that were really true, Counsel, the implications of misconduct would not stop at the supervising coroner. It would taint the honor of the entire judiciary from the ground up. And it's exactly because of those monumental repercussions that Dr. Scythe would consent to any demand made of her by someone who threatened to expose the secret. Even if that meant being complicit in a crime. You... you mean... I mean that Dr. Scythe wasn't collaborating in Mr. Drebber's wicked scheme. She was coerced into collaborating in order to protect a decade-old secret. She switched the dead body of Mr. Asman with a waxwork model and fabricated the autopsy report. Ah! Lord Van Zeeks! 
Pray forgive my freshly filled hollow chalice and a whole raft of other discourtesies now. Oh, goodness me! It's just the sort of tall tale Londoners would enjoy, I grant you. An executed killer rising from the dead, a Scotland Yard cover up, a conspiracy at the highest levels. So let me ask you one thing. What's that? If the condemned man really did emerge from his tomb that night only to be shot in the chest, who pulled the trigger? And dispose of him forever? Uh, well, uh, I have no idea at the moment. We have too little information to work that out at present, I think. I... I couldn't agree more. The Old Bailey is no place for wild fantasies. Ugh. And have you considered this, my learned Nipponese friend? Considered what? Do you realize just what a dangerous endeavor it would be to coerce this woman into such criminal activity? It's tantamount to declaring war on the entire British police force and judiciary. Quite. Hard to imagine any sum of money being offered for research could warrant it. To rely on some stage deception when so much is at stake would be madness. Well, well, I suppose. And this was no petty crime either. The victim was murdered. A man who'd already invested money in the venture and would be instrumental in future profits too. Yes, I had no reason to kill Mr. Asman at all. Or are you forgetting that his death results in me receiving not a single penny? The court is already aware of the contract between myself and the victim. No? Hmm. There's the contract, that's very true. The motive for this case runs deep, though. I can feel it. Using Fress to force the head of the forensic investigation team to cooperate is extreme. Especially for a government grant he had no guarantee of receiving in the first place. If the research grant was the aim, taking Mr. Asman's life would have made no sense anyway. Which means Mr. Drebber's motive wasn't money at all. He was just trying to kill Mr. Asman. But why? What was his motive then? I think we've got the motive. In our back pocket. The motive itself... <laughs> Ah, uh, ah, uh, is in this picture. The ruining of a career, the outing of what he was doing, the banishment into what he had to become after the fact. Odie Asman ruined Enoch Dreber's life. This was personal. But this episode is ending here with a bit of mishap. And a lot of trying to figure things out in the middle of it, that's for sure. I guess I was too beholden, as he gives his excuses, of the camera. And having just got an update to it, thinking, Aha, that's it. Oh, no, we had to wait a little bit first. This article is pretty much everything. Pretty much everything indeed. So, with this link down here, we continue on next time. In the Great Ace Attorney 2. Resolve. I'll see you guys then for more. Bye-bye.